Товарищи! It's good to see you all here today. And it will be even better to see you soon breaking through that wall. Then we'll teach those NATO dogs how to fight. They thought they could bully us into submission. They thought we'd give way and fall. But today, we'll show them that the Red Army bows to no one! Today, we'll show them the might of the Soviet Union! Howdy folks, today I wanted to talk to you about a game that is very near to my heart, World in Conflict or WIC. 2022 is looking like it's going to be a great year for RTS players with games such as Warno, Regiments, Rattenreich, Company of Heroes 3, Men of War 2, Broken Arrow, Warhammer 3, and so many more releasing in the coming months. It seems that 2022 may just be the year where the RTS genre makes its return to the big stage. I've been playing a ton of the Regiment's playtest, and I noticed quite a few similarities between it and World in Conflict, and with me, so many others commented that they felt similarly. It really feels like the Cold War is a hot topic again, maybe even so with recent recent developments spurring this further on. Now many RTS and also FPS games have been using it as their setting. We've seen it in Regiments and War now, but also in After Conflict. World in Conflict had an interesting twist, with Soviet invasions of both Europe and the United States taking place at the same time, and both the NATO and Soviet perspective were playable in the campaign. I really have been wanting to make this video for a while, just showcasing World in Conflict 15 years after its release, and to put that into perspective, Call of Duty World at War and Arma 2 are one and two years younger than World in Conflict respectively. Today, I just wanted to talk about what made World in Conflict so special and showcase some live commentary gameplay of the first mission from a Soviet perspective from this amazing campaign. If you're interested in seeing more World in Conflict, do let me know. Now, the basic premise is that in 1988, the Soviet Union actually invades Europe with the US and NATO deployed in Europe, the Soviets launch a secret second offensive a year later on the US East and West Coast. Posts. The campaign jumps throughout time with flashbacks and flash forwards, seeing you command American, Soviet, as well as European NATO units. An interesting note is that the playable American character is voiced by Alec Baldwin. He narrates mission intros and voices his own thoughts as well as he describes what other characters around him do between campaign battles. Now for gameplay, the developers said that they wanted to give the player a relatively smaller role in a bigger conflict, where you never command huge amounts of forces in single player, and especially not in multiplayer. In single player, you usually have a time limit to clear an objective from enemies before the mission is a failure, and you'll have to make use of very limited units as well as something called tactical aid, which is very similar to what Regiments has as well. This kind of off-map support can be anything from artillery to paratroopers, napalm strikes, even nukes and carpet bombing. In multiplayer, you pick one of four specializations or doctrines before you deploy your forces. Armor, infantry, air, and support each have special units only available to that doctrine. Sometimes units are available to other doctrines, but at an inflated cost. Your chosen units get deployed via parachute, and you are now ready to fight the enemy. With a lot of maps and different game modes, you could fight up to an 8v8 with different levels of well-crafted AI opponents being able to fill empty slots. Again, as in single player, the maximum units on the battlefield at the same time from one player was usually rather low, with about 5 heavy tanks or 5 attack helicopters being the max you could bring out, really focusing more on micro heavy tactics versus a big battle you might see in a command and conquer game. Smaller 1v1 or 2v2 games were available too, which is actually what you're seeing here in the background where all units of all doctrines were available, more of a classic RTS style 
engagement. A huge thing that is often overlooked is the fact that this was an RTS multiplayer game with drop-in and out games. If somebody left a team and turned that game into an 8 versus 7, that was totally fine. The remaining 7 players would share the points normally given to the 8th player until a replacement for that person showed up. Unlike most other RTS games like Command & Conquer, Men of War, Gates of Hell, or Company of Heroes, when a dropped player usually means a huge disadvantage to that team. Tactical Aid also made a return from single player, with players able to give each other points. Say you were 15 points away from a nuclear missile calling, you could ask your team for some and deploy it a little sooner. So with that little intro to World in Conflict out of the way, let's dive into the first Soviet campaign mission where you initiate World War III by crossing the Berlin Wall in a spectacular fashion. Again, if you want another video on War in Conflict, perhaps diving deeper into the game or just more of these campaign videos, let me know. We're finally doing what I wanted to do, which was to showcase the very first mission of World in Conflict. And <laughs> I was started to write this before the current events went down so i don't know if doing a like 1988 1989 sort of cold war game is in bad taste uh, i personally don't think so but it's crazy to think that people at the time were afraid of this and i feel like we're maybe a little close to world war three but anyway we're playing some one in conflict and as i said the graphics of this game are just fantastic still. I actually played some Morno earlier today, and I remember I was praising the graphics in Morno. Now, you have to realize that the maps in Morno are a lot bigger. Um, we're also talking about a game that's 15 years, yes, basically 15 years older than World in Conflict. But even this, this still looks pretty good. That's actually calling some artillery. I think World in Conflict really would shine if there was a way to turn on the replay mode for these single player battles and watch everything from down low. This is still a very good looking game 15 years later. Let's deal with some of these light tanks and medium tanks. I believe their heavies are Abrams, their lights are Sheridans, and their mediums are Pattons. So we see a medium here, looks like an M60. We have an Abrams here, then we just knocked out a Sheridan earlier, but yeah, we can see them there. For the Soviets, I'm actually not sure. It's Okay, these are T-80s. I think there's T-64s? I'm trying to remember what the medium tank is. I can't see, actually. But they are... They're obviously all real vehicles. There isn't any, like, make-believe. This isn't, like, Red Alert or Command & Conquer, right? Where there's, like, random sort of, you know, mammoth tanks and stuff like that. And you can see the uh, explosions in the background, whether it's tactical aid that's being deployed or artillery, uh, fuel air bombs. I mean, I guess we have artillery right now, but we don't really need it. We're just going to be securing these points. This is, again, more of a showcase mission. This isn't a mission that's necessarily meant to, I think, challenge you. This is playing on hard. Uh, this is more, again, a showcase mission where they're trying to teach you how the game works, what to do. Interestingly enough, when the game first released, uh, back in 2007, I want to say, this actually wasn't in the game. There was no Soviet campaign. There was only, I think about 17 American missions, and that was it. Then an add-on came out, very much, I guess, in the old world style where you would go out and, and go to the store and, and buy a game. And the add-on was called Soviet Assault. I think it was a, a couple bucks. And I think every World in Conflict version you could buy afterwards just came with it, like, on online. But it basically added, like, five or six Soviet missions. And it was really cool to see that they decided to add a little bit more story to this game. Really showing that at the time, I think it was Massive who made the original, really cared to add some more story. Now, obviously, Massive Entertainment, I think, was bought by, I want to say, Ubisoft. And then Ubisoft, I don't know if there's, like, issues with the copyright or with the IP. Obviously, no, it's been, you know, 15 years and we haven't gotten a sequel yet. So I don't really think we're going to get one. But one can hope, right? As you can see, World of Conflict does have 
a health bar system. I know not a lot of people are maybe... Well, I feel like in the RTS, you kind of have to have a health bar system. You can do like they do it in Blitzkrieg, where they have a sort of health bar system. I just went over that in uh, my last Gates of Hell video, the one about the Blitzkrieg 2 mod, where you can kind of do what Blitzkrieg 2 didn't have, like fake health bars can kind of do obviously what gates of hell does where there is no health bars for vehicles there's sort of health bars for infantry obviously but you know most of the time infantry dies in one or two shots so this is going to hurt to say i do still think this game looks fantastic when you consider this game is older than Call of Duty World at War, for example. I think World at War came out a year after this game. So, you know, I think that that's pretty impressive. At the same time, when I have looked at Warno just earlier today, more specifically so in a replay where I feel like you can, you know, have a little bit more focused on the graphics and how cool it looks and stuff. Maybe, maybe playing Warno today slightly ruined my perspective on World in Conflict. I still think it looks fantastic. Yeah, maybe Warno does look really good. It, and it should. Warno is 15 years, you know, younger than this game, so it, it really should look better. Ah, oh, Ripper's helicopters. Such a sad... Oh, look at the helicopter came apart in like three or four pieces. That was really cool looking. It's just... Yeah, I, I guess it's showing its age, and that's fair enough. You know, hey, this this game is 15 years old. I feel like I'm, every time people in the comments are being like, oh, take a shot every time he says 15 years old, but I'm just... I played this game for such a long time, and it's kind of funny to see how... Now, personally, I can see maybe that it aged slightly worse than I thought it did. Okay, we're going to grab those points. We're going to... We just called in some tactical aid again, and I love doing these. These are going to be SU-25 strafing runs. We'll see them coming in here in a second. Love the look of that. Okay, saved the flank. Smoking up with our tanks, because then the helicopters can't shoot us. Unless they had a recon helicopter, but yeah, they do not. We can see, oh, look at the Mars, the uh, German, or no, not the Mars, the M270 rocket launchers in the background there. It's a semi-introductory mission, because this originally, obviously, like I said, wasn't the first mission a player would play, but it kind of became that, right, after people bought into this game, you know, let's say a year or so after release. So it's weird, there are technically two first missions in one in conflict though i feel like this game is a very good example of how to get people to learn i would say this isn't a complicated game you don't have to learn anything like you know this isn't like a hoy like where you have to understand what you're doing you know it's just shoot kill and you're using tanks and anti-air and stuff like that but there are some peculiar peculiarities peculiarities is that how you say it? peculiarities i'm not I'm not a native speaker, so I feel like I have an excuse to not know it exactly, but there's definitely some specific things to World in Conflict that I think they teach you throughout the campaign. You don't go from mission one to mission three and you're fully ready. I think it takes like 12 or so missions, or maybe more, for you to get a grasp, I think, of how the game works. So right now, for example, we just called in uh, some more armor. I did talk about this, obviously, in the scripted part of this video, but uh, a plane, there it is. It's kind of hard to see because of the sun. Is that an AN-12? AN IL-76, I think, drops off a tank. And then if we, let's say we lost a heavy tank, we'd get back 1,200 points over time. It would end up here and start going towards the left point system until we got our 1,200 points back. But we got an extra armor. This will be kind of useful, I think. It just has to reinforce section B. And as you can see, this is brutal. Look at the frames. We're still getting perfect frames right here. I know, yes, it's an old game on my computer. You know, is what, like four years old by now, and the game is like 15 years old. But... I just, I gotta keep saying that, because I think it is so important to stress that to me personally, how good this game looks. Let's push up, engage the, M, almost the MI-24s, the uh, Apaches. There we go. We're going to be getting TU-95 support and uh, bombing straight down the most important street in Berlin, which is just looks, it's going to look very cinematic, but in the meantime, we get to call in these suckers, those ones. 
These fuel air bombs are fantastic. They are, they look cool and they are very effective. You'll see that in a second as we uh, call in, I think it's a MiG-29 that drops it. See if we can maybe see it coming in here. I don't know if we can. Oh, there it is. Anyway, oh, I've kind of missed it now. We're going to call in another one. We're going to call in one at a time. You can see uh, it's 30 for one, 50 for two. Uh, so you kind of save like 20 points uh, by buying it in triplets. But obviously that only works in certain missions or in multiplayer. And uh, not, not everything, by the way, has a discount on it. Not every single unit or every single ability uh, is a discount. Uh, some units or some abilities, they are just as expensive to get three as it is to get two or to get one. Here comes our plane. There it is. And love that look. It looks very cool. Something that... What was kind of weird, so the Soviets have the fuel air bomb, and what it does is it immediately drops from the plane, and there's basically no getting away from it. Now, the Americans, they get basically, I think it's a big plane like that, and it drops two parachutes, and it's an actual fuel air bomb, but it does take longer to hit the ground, and if enemies are on the edge of the circle, it could give the enemies on the outside of this circle a chance to get away. Something that obviously is not half as important or as a single player as a multiplayer, but it's definitely a thing. Actually, it's an SU-25. It's not a MiG. That looks super cool. And here we see our... I'm trying to look at eyes on. There's our three TU-95s. They're going to be coming in, doing the coolest thing in maybe the entire game right here. Look at the danger closeness on that. Talk about broken arrow. The uh, helicopters, the Cobra... And the Apache actually got shot in or hit in midair. And that finishes a crazy mission where I feel like I talk too much over the character speaking. But I've played this campaign twice now. Once on, I think, hard or normal and once on very hard. Yeah, we're probably going to call it there. If you guys are interested in, in seeing more of this game, I would love to play it again. Absolutely probably my all-time favorite if not my top three rts games we are gonna leave it here i hope you guys enjoyed just a little bit of a look at world in conflict a 15 year old rts has stood the passing of time and i'll catch you in the next one best soon today was an easy victory who knows about tomorrow <laughs>